Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural session of Espresso Live, an online thought leadership forum featuring procurement leaders and practitioners. My name is Shakti Prasad, and I'm your host today. I'm the head of content at Vero, and I run the Procurement Espresso magazine. Before I get started with the session, just a few housekeeping rules to be kept in mind. All the participants will be on listen-only mode for the entire duration of the webinar. We will take up the questions at the end of the presentation, but we would encourage our attendees to key in their questions anytime during the session. Please type them into the question box given in your control panel. There could be a lag of few seconds in between the transition of slides. So please bear with us. If you have any difficulty in joining the webinar, please try to log back in or key in your queries in the Q&A box and we will try to help you. Now, I'm happy to introduce two industry stalwarts, Thomas Woodison, the CPO of Bayer and Bertrand Pankar, CPO of Henkel. I hope you all can see both of them on the screen. And the topic is sustainability procurement plunge. Amidst the sea of negative news during the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, one positive headline stood out. Air pollution and CO2 emissions fell rapidly as the virus went global, primarily caused by reduced traffic and social activities. Needless to say, air quality is expected to return to its prior state, that is bad, when the shutdown ends and normalcy is restored. And when, and when it returns, the pollution will impose both health and economic costs. It is time for every individual to take responsibility towards protecting the environment. Well, this statement sounds lofty, but have we considered whether it is possible for us to implement it in our day-to-day -day lives, especially in our work lives as procurement professionals? A couple of weeks ago, I posed this question to Thomas Edison, the Chief Procurement Officer of Bayer, who's also a passionate sustainability ambassador. And his response was quick. He said, it is very much possible and totally necessary. Like you, I'm also eager to know how best to incorporate sustainability initiatives in our day-to-day -day life. Without further ado, I hand over the stage to Thomas and Bertrand. Hello, gentlemen, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I think I will have the uh, unique pleasure of starting this uh, webinar. And uh, I think I want to send, first of all, a thanks to, to Sakti and the Bureau team for, for actually picking up this uh, topic, because it's a topic that uh, both Bertrand and I uh, are absolutely convinced uh, is mission critical. It's mission critical for us as a individual, it's us as a society, but also us as procurement uh, professionals. And uh, Michelle, if you can go to the next slide. Um, what, what we will be sharing with you uh, in the next couple of minutes is uh, a little bit of perspective from uh, Bayer the side. Uh, what is it that we have observed? Uh, Bertrand will be sharing um, an industry perspective of you know, what is it that uh, corporations can be doing to collaborate much more together and with that joint forces to have a bigger impact. And then we will get into uh, what is that we can do as individuals, touching on the, uh, the progress, the work we've done so far as the uh, sustainable procurement uh, pledge. But I think this sentence that you see on the screen right now is, is critical, and, and that's uh, you know, a fundamental uh, statement that uh, both of us believe in, and that is uh, sustainability in the supply chain is our responsibility, us as procurement uh, professionals. There is really no chance for us to look the other way any longer. It's not an add-on. It is, is what we have to do. And the more recent uh, experiences that many have had also linked with COVID proves the point that if you want to have a resilient supply chain, it is a sustainable supply chain. So these two uh, themes are closely interlinked and we'll be sharing with you why we think that is the case. 
Next. So I'll be starting now with the uh, perspective from uh, from Bayer, and I think I will ask for two next, if I can. Here we go. Okay. I believe I will see it visually very, very, very soon. So next, Mishun. Okay. So so here we are, and I think all of us are reading reading the news. Uh, many of us uh, are, are following what is really happening uh, in the world, and and uh, I think also the fact that you are on this call probably signals that you are also not in doubt of this uh, truth. You know, we see that uh, climate change is a reality, and um, we also thankfully see that the number of people who is questioning whether this is really a uh, sustainable issue is dramatically uh, reducing. We see scarcity, we've seen an increase of natural disasters. We see conflicts happening in, in areas and we see a, a general problem around uh, migration. We are also accepting that we are facing a humanitarian challenge. Uh, we have increasing populations, we have aging populations. Of course, one of the fundamental questions we have as society is how do we keep uh, everybody healthy? How do we make sure they have enough food? How do we educate uh, people and, and how do we create that in such a way that societies can pay for all of these aspects? Globalization has also evolved. You know, some people are talking about a, a new era post globalization. We now start seeing geopolitical conflicts that we haven't had to deal with for, for many years as procurement professionals, but also as, as citizens. We see trade blocks, we see restrictions, certain aspects that we also have not had to deal with in the last uh, couple of years. And there is no doubt that the, the increase of disruptions that we are seeing in our supply chains, if they're not managed very well, is also on an increase. And then there's a whole topic around digitalization. Disruptive innovation. And next slide, please. The fact that we have this digitalization also has a significant impact on on what is it that uh, is now different for, for industry. And what we see is there are a different industry uh, implications. Just next, there you go. So um, there is no doubt that uh, uh, the way to respond to the new paradigm is through increased industry uh, collaboration. Um, it's not a, a period where any uh, corporation can be standing on their own. Uh, it is through collaboration that uh, solutions to the problems that we are facing will also uh, be, uh, be found. We also will see an emergence of uh, supply ecosystems that will be looking to find uh, new solutions. In fact, if you look at the COVID-19, many of us are, are working on that by or not, we'll see that the solution has also been through uh, collaboration. I've never in my 15, 17 years in procurement ever experienced as much collaboration across companies, across industries, trying to help each other to deal with these uh, challenges that we are facing. And we will also see, on the back of digitalization, new industry entrants. There are new ways of delivering the same value proposition. Look how we are now uh, doing everything virtually. Same happens for many industries. So there's really a disruption happening to a lot of the more traditional industrial age companies. And if they are now not able to embrace the new way of operating through digitalization, through new ways of delivering their value, a lot of those corporations will really also cease to move. I think also uh, on the back of technology, there will be a need for a dramatic uh, process redesign. And as a procurement professional, you would also uh, have heard that we are not really considered to be the simplest uh, sort of function to, to work with a lot of uh, exceptions, a lot of uh, complicatedness has creeped into our function over the last many, many years. We will have to change that completely, be much more human-centric, user-centric in how we deliver our value. And as we also see industries changing, we will see a migration of, uh, of labor. The right competence for what you are now looking for may not be where you historically had to work for. So we will have to deal with a period where there is migration there's a competency shift also for what we will have as, uh, as procurement uh, professionals, but also as uh, 
Next. Just hang on. There we are. The good thing, um, I think also, uh, as I assume most of you, and I even see some of your names, by the way, so it's good to see some, uh, some good old friends. The, the good thing is that, that we as procurement professionals are really uh, part of the solution. Um, as this industry will go through a evolutionary change, or maybe even a revolutionary change, there will be significant portfolio changes across different uh, companies. And here procurement is really uh, sitting in the middle of, of that, making sure that the divestitures, the acquisitions, the portfolio changes of brands, products, etc., are being supported. Um, a lot of focus will be around innovation, top line, business model, readjustment, coming also out of uh, digitalization. The whole topic of supply uh, chains uh, being sustainable and resilient, we'll go a little bit into the, the depth of this one, but that's at the heart and the core of existence for, for most manufacturing uh, organizations, as we also see now in, in the last couple of weeks. Risk management will continue to be key, not uh, just uh, looking at what do you do when things have happened, but also look at how do you prevent that. And then having stronger relationships with our suppliers, with the partners, looking at how do you create those long-term relationships that are also necessary when you have to call in favors. There will be a new era coming up where collaboration across companies, across networks will also have to be stronger. Next, please. We will here be looking a little bit at what, what are we then saying uh, in sustainable supply chain. Now let's take our uh, buyer methodology as an example of, of how we, we go about that. You will see that uh, most of this is, uh, is linked with the um, UN Global Compact principles. Um, you will see that we as a company have also signed up for the uh, science-based targets. So we have a, a code of conduct that uh, captures all the, the key aspects, whether it is uh, ethics, whether it's quality, whether it's labor, it's HSE. And um, you know, that's all well integrated into our code of conduct. And, and we make that stick. It's really important if, if you are not participating and adhering to our Contact, there will be basically no business uh, with us. And um, if you want to be a key or strategic partner, we have expectations of a minimum threshold. If you don't meet that, you will simply not be key and strategic, and the business opportunities that you would like to have will over time be uh, dramatically reduced. With the science based targets, and more and more companies have now signed up for that, um, you're of course not looking at your own operations exclusively. So we have uh, committed to become carbon neutral for scope one and two, that's fine. But if you go into science-based targets, you're also responsible for scope three. So all the carbon that you are now importing into your supply chain. And, and that's one of the big goals for procurement also moving forward, that we, we need to make sure that we are capable of managing with one additional variable, which is the carbon footprint. So price, quality, time will always be important, but carbon is now becoming equally important. We have the code of conduct. We are also living on the uh, conviction that we do not believe that we want to stand alone as a uh, corporation. We believe that the solution on sustainable supply chains is through collaboration. And we have a series of collaborations where we are putting all our efforts. One is together, that's all we'll, we'll cover that in a, in a minute which is a chemical initiative uh, that we started jointly with Henkel and uh, four other companies back in 2011. We are also a participant in the pharma supply chain initiative, where we are also making sure that we are able to share audits, um, we are able to share practices so that we have a bigger impact also in our supply chain. First of making people aware, assessing them, but also putting our resources together to develop those uh, and then we have the individual uh, dimension here, the uh, SPP. So you know, not everybody is so lucky that they work for an organization that takes sustainability for critical, as we do. So the sustainable procurement place is also here as an individual to say that I have a role every single day with my actions as a procurement professional. And we also support that. So we are really looking at 
company, we are looking at collaboration, and we are looking at the individual SKUs for, for moving forward. And I think Bertrand, as our president of uh, Together for Sustainability, I could hardly imagine somebody more qualified to explain a little bit about why are we doing this and what is it that TFS stands for. So, Mishun, next, and I will hand over to Bertrand. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Um, thank you uh, for the introduction um, on what you are doing in particular at Bayer and the sustainability. And thank you also for the extraordinary uh, relationship and the cooperation that we have together. Um, together for sustainability, um, moving to uh, the next slide is, um, is a fantastic uh, story. It's a fantastic initiative um that um we have kicked off a couple of years ago exactly in 2011 with six or uh, five other members six with Henkel, and all together uh sharing a sense of responsibility versus sustainability but also a question how to make it how to engage and how to be able to really have an impact when it comes to sustainability related to procurement so we have um, together developed a strategy, a vision, um, and an approach. But importantly is that um, now, nine years later, we are 26 companies. We have 26 companies, 26 members, as joined last week exactly, during our General Assembly. Um, and that's wonderful because you can see the number below. Uh, together, if we look at the global spend that we represent together, um we have uh, together we are sharing 282 billions so it's, it's it's an opportunity to impact 282 billions of contracts it is 282 billions of decisions and and this with all the teams um, of procurement teams and all the colleagues associated to this taking decisions along sustainability principles and um this initiative has been uh, really trying to drive and to foster the resilience, the efficiency, the sustainability of the global supply chains in the chemical industry. So global, regional, and local. And very importantly, when it comes to sustainability, to create an impact, the most important is first to have transparency. And transparency on where are we when it comes to sustainability performance. And where that measurement is done to be able to start to work on improvement and improvement along the value chain together with our suppliers and together towards our customers the approach to make it has been to say we will stop the situations where every company does it for itself but we will have a supplier engagement and the supplier engagement program through assessments and audits but what makes a difference with tfs is we call it together and we decided from the beginning that if we want to have the chance to make an impact we need to have a situation and a process where an assessment of one is an assessment for all an audit for one is an audit for all in other words sustainability it's an organization it is um, a model that everybody managed together and we have the chance to accelerate it together and you could have stayed on the on the on the next chart it was perfect together has allowed us to move and to and to at that stage have created supplier assessment to a large extent to twelve thousand five hundred and and audits but let me now on that chart explain to you a little bit the process we have decided to manage. It starts with spent analysis and spent risk analysis in each of the company members. And all very much directly to supply your code of conduct. So all of that is the starting point. Each TFS member is responsible, of course, to manage and to embed all these results into his or um, uh, uh, business responsibilities and relationship but very importantly is that 
we are each member managing a lot of assessments to our uh, supplier base at different stage of the cycle life and relationship and all these assessments are following the standards that we have kicked off originally with ECOVADIS. We match together and we found a very strategic relationship. These assessments are following one standard managed by one provider centralized in one place. And this is the basis where we can start sharing that information and each member can start from there also corrective action. When we want to go deeper, because an assessment has eventually identified a very critical situation or sensitive area where we want to have definitely all the details clarified for internal purposes or towards customers, then we engage in audit. An audit is an implant in situ deep dive process that we are managing with auditors that we have hired, that we have qualified and that we are following through the processes that we have established. And all these processes are always the same across all the audits that we are conducting. And of course, at the end of an audit, there is a corrective action and all of these being into the pool and the pool can, be, uh, can serve also all the inputs necessary that each of the colleagues can, can have and capture the data that we need to conduct our respective all of this managed very compliantly, respecting all the rules of compliances, but importantly, we are in the ratio of 50 to 60 percent share. So that means we have through this process been able to very, very much accelerate. And very importantly, what we are doing is that this is managed by our teams. We don't delegate it. The procurement teams of each of the members are conducting these activities. And if we go to the next chart, we can go a little bit more deeper into the numbers that we have been able to manage together. Together is important because through the together, we are managing at scale. 14,000 supplier sustainability evaluation conducted. And with this, uh, through a very important numbers of shared supplier assessment and also shared supplier audit. It is important also to say that as we are leading and driving improvements, an assessment has a validity of three years. And after three years, we reassess. And then the measurement of the two assessments gives us an indication if we had or not improvements. And this is what you can see that last year, 1,700 suppliers have demonstrated improvement into this process. And that's very, very important. It is not only for us as members, it is also for all the suppliers towards their customer base. And it is one process for all across. So we have a scalability effect. We have a best practice effect. And we have an opportunity We also with this to engage our own teams and becoming also managers and leaders in sustainability in everything that they do in procurement, but also into their future career. This is what has happened with Together for Sustainability, and we are very, very glad uh, that we crossed 10 years in 2021. And with this, we have just relaunched, uh, or developed, and um, um, uh, addressed, um, communicated our new strategy moving forward for 2025, creating even more impact, um, as it is extremely important to be very impactful over the next five to 10 years. Now, moving to the next slide, I am extremely happy to share an inspiration from Thomas and something that we have combined it very, very quickly together on a Saturday morning a couple of months ago. Thomas was uh, very uh, inspired by the uh, Fridays for Future. I was very inspired by the business for inclusive growth, which took place prior to one of the last G7. And on a Saturday morning, we were talking about sustainability. And we said, how can we even accelerate even more? And how can we do something very different? Not starting from wonderful organizations running and driving sustainability around the globe, industries and associations, but more than us as individuals, as we were inspired by, in particular, this Friday for Future. Moving to the next, we have realized that procurement has a wonderful opportunity 
to mobilize all the eye, all the eye of procurement managers. Imagine that if all of us, I, dealing, making decisions and engaging with suppliers, if all these I would connect and would connect along principles, principles related to standing for people and our planet, a principle along all together, we will change the world. Starting with myself, not delegating myself, sharing my knowledge and listening to others and leaving the right legacy. Imagine that all of us, all procurement manager around the globe, independently to any industries and countries, we would really together walk the talk along these principles. Then all together, we have the scalability. We have the scalability, we have the acceleration, and we have the opportunity to really impact sustainability to what it deserves to be and really what are the urgencies and the priorities that we have ahead of us. And to go deeper, i like at that stage to give to Thomas the opportunity to tell you what has happened over the last five months and where we are today and even ready to go to the next level over the next week. Thomas. Thank you, thank you. And, and I think, uh, uh, Bertrand, you will probably confirm it's been a very busy uh, uh, five months. A lot, has, uh, a lot has happened. And uh, as none of us have, uh, let's say, practical experience of trying to run a grassroots movement, we've had to uh, scratch our own uh, learning uh, a little bit here and there. And, and I think that's what we're doing. And in fact, that's, that's very, very important. Um, but um, what has also been rewarding is that with the launch of the pledge, um, it's obvious that uh, we have tapped into a, a wealth of, uh, of passion um, from around the world. So we have uh, since then more than 1,100 ambassadors around the world. But, and so maybe you can take the next uh, slide. By 1,100 uh, ambassadors from around the world, uh, we literally have uh, almost the smallest uh, island to the, to the tallest mountain. Um, we have people from academia, we have people, students, young professionals, we have middle management, we have CPOs, we have all uh, industries represented. So obviously what we are saying here is something that strikes a chord with a lot uh, of people. And what is it that we are ultimately trying to ensure? And that is that, that we are using our everyday uh, decision power which we hold by making deals. We have the discretion, are we gonna go left or right? Are we gonna accept this or not accept this? It sits in every single individual decision that we are, we are making. And why would we think that is important? Because we believe that the sustainable development goals by United Nations should be met by 2030. Now, there's lots of scenarios of what happens if we don't. We don't really wanna get into that scenario planning. We wanna make sure that what has been agreed also unilaterally across nations is being supported. And that's what we want to do. And the strategy of doing that is by activating our, our network. Again, 1,100 people, super passionate, who all wants to have a impact, who wants to spread the word, who wants to uh, make sure that this grassroots bottom-up approach is also meeting all the top-down initiatives that, that we see, whether it's from governments, whether it's from companies, and these uh, ambassadors are with that also becoming the, uh, the catalyst of, of knowledge, of sharing practices uh, as we move forward. Um, and what we want to do with this is make sure that the individual contributor, every person who is associated with the procurement process, should feel that their impact matters. So we want to celebrate the individual. It doesn't matter if you are a CPO of the largest corporation, or you are a buyer of a small family-owned uh, company, everybody should make the right decision within their area of responsibility. And also accept that sustainability is no longer a add-on. It, it's not a add-on that, oh, by the way, we run our procurement and we also have to do a little bit of sustainability. No, it is absolutely and fully integrated. I think that's the uh, message that we have uh, conveyed what is resonating and uh, just a, a more recent update 
since we have grown much faster and further than what we would even have dared to uh, imagine, we also wanted, in the spirit of being inclusive and listening to others, reach out to the ambassador and say, what is it really that, that you want to, um, what is it you want to do next? What's the next evolution of, uh, of SPP? And there's uh, very clear feedback coming from the, uh, the community, independently of, of where you are, uh, industry-wise or seniority-wise. One is that, that everybody wants to have access to practical knowledge. Everybody wants to hear from other peers who have been in the same situation, who had the same frustration, who didn't know exactly where to start, but there is a way to, to do that. Um, everybody also wants to become better at uh, raising the business case and raising senior leadership support for actually uh, driving this and endorsing it with the necessary resources that are required to also do this. Um, and everybody want to have this, how do I get, get started? And what we, what we have concluded based on the feedback from our ambassadors is that we are uh, in the next uh, weeks, we hope, going to launch a, a collaboration platform where ambassadors can ask questions, share topics, progress, um, as uh, this is really what, what people have. They want to learn and they want to share. So that's the next evolution. And if there are any of... Uh, the ambassadors on the call, uh, that's thanks for, for providing us this feedback. We take that very seriously and we will be coming back to you shortly. Mishton, if we can just take the next slide. But this is where, you know, if you're wondering, so, so what is this? How could I possibly uh, engage? Um, I would uh, very much invite you to, to check out on LinkedIn um, the actual uh, pledge, which has its own uh, Web, uh, LinkedIn profile, so it's a company. But even better, of course, if you want to uh, believe in the uh, in the principles, the five principles that are all shared, then we would really uh, welcome you to uh, to the group. And you can see here that's the the actual uh, link that we are we are having. And with that, you know, you you commit to follow the five principles in your everyday life. You will not be audited by Bertrand or me or anybody else. It's linked to your own integrity. It's a personal codex. It's if you say, I'm a procurement professional, I don't see sustainability as an add-on, it's absolutely integrated. And I think what, again, what we've seen in the last few, few weeks is that the companies that took sustainability, risk management very, very seriously can also now look back at a post-COVID reality where the impact was less than the companies who did not do that. So we are firm believers that a resilient supply chain is also equals a uh, sustainable supply chain. And with that, I would um, close our presentation part and uh, open it up for, for q and I really, really hope that uh, you have uh, many questions. Our hope is that uh, this is a bit of a thought provoker, it's an appetizer. But let's see if we can get into a, a dialogue and uh, we would very much welcome that. So don't be shy. The first question is always difficult, but uh, even if that's the case, then Sakti can help you with the, with the first question. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining. Let's open the Q&A, please. Sakti, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Bertrand. Uh, we have received a few questions, uh, but I would like to start off with this question. Uh, Procurement sometimes feel that they are not empowered enough uh, to launch new initiatives. What would you tell such teams when it comes to implementing the sustainability program and what they should be doing in order to push this through uh, within their organization, especially if there is no formal uh, sustainability program? I mean, but, 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 and that's a notion which we have seen very consistently also in our ambassador group. Um, there is a notion that uh, we don't know everything and how do we almost attack the topic uh, uh, in, a, in the smartest way. And there's probably not one universal uh, silver bullet that, that works for, for everybody. My recommendation is literally to, to get going, you know, build the courage. Um, if if the intention of your drive, the change you are planning to do is to make your company stronger and more sustainable, 
I don't think many bad things can really happen. Um, so I would say, you know, have the courage, get going, maybe start small, reach out to peers. The ambassador community is, is one such uh, option. And don't wait for the solution to fall down from the sky. Uh, with any change, it has to have a little bit of uh, entrepreneurship, start, build the courage, and get going. And what you will find out is that you are really not alone. Um, so, so there's a massive network that uh, that would be there to, to support you. And I think again, you know, we would would be happy to to share our experiences as well. Just just get going and, and get out of this notion that it's an add-on. It's not. It is your responsibility if you happen to be a procurement professional. Uh, thank you, Thomas. So, in fact, there's another question which is closely related uh, uh, to what I had asked. This is from Mark Norville. For a firm just starting out on a sustainability program, what are the initial steps you would recommend and pitfalls to navigate around that? Thank you. Well, the initial step, if we talk about initial step, um, I think it is extremely critical to, um, to get transparency. Transparency is the beginning of measurement. We can manage what we can measure, and, 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 and really going into that uh, transparency is extremely helpful. Uh, today, many organizations are proposing um, also to go through wonderful associations are proposing some assessment processes. Um, we have started into TF tests, for example, with Ecovalis, and it has helped a lot to learn, to learn on ourselves, to learn on the process, and to start to get that transparency. That, that's, I think, the main message to me is when you want to go in, try to get that transparency done. And I think the transparency done is full of learning, and, and these learnings can become the beginning of a conversation into, the, into your departments, into the company, and with other peers. And um, across industries, organizations are existing where that conversation can take place. And um, Thomas has presented SPP, it is one platform for conversation, but there are also other organizations more dedicated in different industries, which allow also that conversation. And these conversations, very importantly, are to be translated into activity, into activities which make sense for um, enhancing the sustainability of the business into which you are. Yeah, and, and I think that's why I, I would just build because I think, again, the, the, the painful experience we all have now with uh, COVID-19 also offers a opportunity for companies to, to learn and reflect. Um, and I am 100% convinced that the companies that have invested into sustainable supply chains, making sure they understood where do you have the risk, uh, Figuring out how do you prevent and mitigate that risk upfront? They are the companies who are weathering this storm much, much better than anybody else. <clears throat> and if, if you're finding that you are in an organization that has not really understood this, or you happen to have a leadership who doesn't get that, um, I think those uh, use cases from the companies whose factories are all running uh, and who is weathering the storm will be very meaningful for them to also reflect. Do we need to change the, the path forward? I'm personally convinced that the companies that are not seeing this and who are not already preparing for that are looking at a very grim outlook. I would say as industries evolve, those companies are not likely to be left standing after the industry changes have, have happened. And, and I think here at, at, at some point also as an individual, we need to uh, to vote with our decisions, with our feet. And if we are unable to drive progress uh, sustainably in the organizations where we reside, it may be time to you know, look for something else. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, we have a question from Hilary Smith. There are often competing priorities in procurement organizations. What guidance do you have for teams collaborating with uh, organization leadership? What tactics should we take when leadership focuses on short-term costs associated with CSR investments, 
and does not see the big picture. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. No, no I, I think it, it's unfortunately the reality for, for many, I, I know. Um, and it's a source of disappointment from me that there are senior procurement leaders who doesn't appreciate, again, the interdependency between sustainability and resilience and will prioritize one dimensionally the cost dimension. Um, I don't think that's the philosophy of successful procurement of the future. I recognize there are people like that. Um, as I said, at, at some point, we, we all have to, to raise the, the, uh, the need, and we can use uh, lots of rational argumentation. Uh, sustainability equals you know, good business. Maybe with a different time dimension, but it is how you are successful over a long period of time. And and I have shared with with a lot of uh, CPOs also that if if you don't get this, that this is good business, long term business. You know, maybe now is the time to step aside and let the next generation you know take over the helm. I think that's what we need to uh, to ask for. So I recognize it exists, but I wouldn't personally accept it. Me neither, um, and because it's a mindset. And uh, in those days, I think we have um, a very good uh, and unfortunate example that the impossible is possible. Uh, I mean, the impact of COVID is huge. And um, the impact of everything that we will not manage properly along sustainability will have massive impact. And um, that's why when we start with transparency, understanding the existing has nothing to do with cost. It has just to do with responsibility. And uh, when we engage with uh, companies which are acting with compliance along the responsibility and along the UN uh, compact principles, it is not expensive or cheap. It is responsibility. And then, and then, and then, and this is, this is at the end of the day, what makes the value that a company will bring into its uh, product, into its services, into the uh, messages and the marketing around. And this is what drives us. And, um, yeah. and, and this, this is something to which we are strongly believing that innovation is a, 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 an immense lever for sustainability. Leadership is sustainability. And this is what we strongly believe as of today, that everywhere, everywhere, all these uh, story cost, expensive, is something which uh, drives sustainability, is something that we really need to change because there are no other solutions. No. Okay. Uh, so question, thanks. Yeah, okay. So we have another question here. Uh, sorry, I could not get the name of the person who has asked this, but here is the question. One of the expected outcomes of the COVID-19 pandemic is the shortening and regionalization of supply chains. In your opinion, will it also help to make the supply chains more sustainable due to sh shorter transport routes? Potentially, uh, yes. I mean, shortening and uh, and eventually less travel, less distances, we will of course have an impact. Yeah? So it is one element of the equation. At the same time, um, optimization is also an element which have to be taken into account independently to distances. So I think the topic will be more along um, ensuring that the ecosystem around our products, raw materials, packaging, that that ecosystem at the end of the day, delivers on that sustainability path. This is, I think, the most important that we need to look at um, and to have a diversity in it and the right diversity. So that, 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 that's probably where we need to put efforts to look at um, not only the resilience of the supply chains, but all the elements of that supply chain, not only a tier one supply, but also tier two, tier three to understand the degree of sustainability that we have into that supply chain. 
And also, what are the components of it? You know, in order to understand what is the value of sustainability that I am delivering along my supply chain. But COVID is, is an extremely good time of reset, of rethinking, and really now taking actions and decisions along these principles. That's a very good question. Thank you very much. I, I agree. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's true, it has to be a balance. So, so it's not going to be one or the other. Um, and there will not be so many absolutes in, in the solution. It's always finding the right balance for what you're trying to, to achieve. I think for the companies that are now signing up for science-based targets, as, as we have done, um, you know, the CO2 footprint, the footprint of the scope three becomes part of the, uh, the equation. And, and that's also very much linked with how do you then ultimately set up the, uh, the supply chain? What do you have close? What are the trade-offs? Um, how do you mathematically maybe uh, capture that? Um, do you need to activate offsetting programs? It, it's really a, a new domain where, again, the carbon input has an equal uh, standing as the more traditional time cost and and, and, uh, and uh, time cost and quality, right? So, so that's that's what makes I think even procurement. If you now look for the next five to ten years, it makes it super fascinating because we have to find those solutions, and it's through innovation, new thinking, new solutions, technology. Okay, uh, you know we have a message. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll just read out the message fully. Good afternoon. Thanks much for the for the presentation. I am Roberto Martinez, EMEA head of procurement at Avery Denison. Fully believe in transparency and actively work with FSC, Ecovades, and other NGOs. What is your view on credit systems, ISCC, mass balance leads to sustainability? Thank you. Yeah, I think mass balance. Uh, I think what, what, was it RSPO? Oh, Ooh, we lost you. Are you there? Oh, yeah, I'm there. I'm there. I think sorry. we got a feedback there, uh, thing here. Okay, I I didn't hear the question whether it was linked with the RSPO um, or whether it's linked with the more philosophy around uh, mass balancing. Um, yeah, if, if I assume it's, it's, it's okay. I mean, what what I would say is a mass balance is of course in some highly complex commodities like palm oil um, the most practical first step that one can take, um, where the traceability for liquids are very very hard to keep uh, this uh, separate. Uh, through a, a full chain of con, uh, chain of custody, so I think it's it's a it's a good vehicle. It's not necessarily the best, the purest, but it's a very very good and practical step in the right direction. That would be my uh, perspective. Okay, that's all because I think you're doing it also for for palm oil, right? Yeah. Nothing to add. I mean, this is this is a process, and that's the uh, step one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can I proceed with the next question? Yeah. yeah. So here, here is our next question: of How widespread are the consortiums, such as the one presented for the chemical industries? Uh, are they working the same with other industries? Can you repeat your question? Apologize, the acoustic was not very good. Sorry for that. Okay. How widespread are the consortiums, such as the one presented for the chemical industries? Are they working the same in other industries? I think he is looking for. I think the question here is: uh, Will consortiums work in uh, bringing about uh, sustainability programs across wide range of companies? Yeah. That's what I mentioned a bit a bit before. I mean, um, in industries, we see a lot of um, organizations um, dedicated by industries and, um, and and addressing the the elements of each of these industries. So, um, the motive industry is one, for example. Uh, you see it everywhere. I mean, uh, transportation, um, yeah. and um, and I think there is um, 
I think what is very good is that each of these activities which have been managed into the respective industries have reached a certain degree of maturity. And one of our colleagues of SPP has organized a few days ago um, a, a platform where many of these um, different um, initiatives were there. And I think that now we are more talking about um, how to recognize each other, or at least what can we recognize from other initiatives in order to enhance the ability uh, to even uh, accelerate assessments or leave, to leverage that know-how that we uh, can share across. So um, I think this is a very healthy and a very uh, positive and optimistic process um, that we are leaving the silos in order to cross to cross fertilize. Um, and, and, and I do think that the next uh, years we'll see a lot of acceleration in that field. Thomas? Yeah, I, I'm completely with you. And, and I think the, the call that happened uh, last week where, where we had the FMCG in progress, CSR drive sustainable from the automotive, we had the electronics, we've got the uh, different associations all together, even with some regulators, starting, starting to look at you know, how, can we, how can we collaborate and what's even the correct regulatory framework to also make sure that there is more exchange possible and that we can pull in the same direction, maybe with capability building, training, et cetera. So I'm, I'm really excited that we have we've reached across all the industries that level of maturity that we are now looking to strengthen. Um, and, and I, you know, a couple of years ago, that would not have happened. So it, it's, it's very much in the spirit of this maybe post-COVID reality, where the solution on sustainability is collaboration. You know, we do not compete on securing the, our species and protecting our planet. That's not where we compete. That's where we collaborate. There are many other areas where, where we as organizations will be able to compete. But let's not do it on securing the future of our children. That's just not right. Okay. Well, we have a question around uh, suppliers. Uh, is the sentiment in the supplier community also aligned with these initiatives? Uh, in other words, is there cooperation from suppliers or is it an uphill struggle? If, if I may, I mean, um, on the process, um, probably at the beginning, some questions were raised, but very quickly, our suppliers are very much addressed by different companies coming with different questionnaires and different assessments. It, it's terrible. So, I mean, the more we are organized, the less also complexity we bring into this. And very quickly, we have realized that, um, and suppliers have realized by doing this into a standardized, harmonized way, accelerate, simplify, and again, is also giving to these suppliers the ability to engage with multiple customers. And, and I think that we have seen a simple opportunity through this um, to gain in, in the acceptance, and to gain also into the, 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 the process of improving. The more, uh, the more improvement they, are, they have, the more also, uh, the more the rating into the index on sustainability increases in the case, for example, of these index managed by ecobodies, which are public, which are visible, which are also a new identity and image of progress. And I think a signal to the procurement of organizations with which company do you want to associate your own company? And, and, and from that point of view, we have moved now beyond, uh, I don't want to participate or it is too much administration. Um, we have now created uh, a change of mindset and the collaboration is much more on engaging into the improvements and the change and doing the same into their own supply base. So through that progress, we can go to tier two, tier three, and have impact where we yesterday were more facing administrative burden. Thomas? Okay. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, but if, if you ask some of the, our sources in the organization who've had to pick up the phone and explain, you know, they would say it's been hard work. And I think across all our member companies, our people have really been lifting weight. To, to raise the awareness and also uh, make sure that suppliers are embracing this. Of course, in, in some uh, cases, um, suppliers refused 
and in most of the member companies, it has a very clear consequence. You know, none of us expect an absolute A grade um, at the exam, but what we expect is a commitment to be above a certain threshold and a commitment to improve. And when we see that that is not happening, um, it really raises a fundamental question, why would we do business with such a, a company, also linked with resilience? Because if, if, again, if you don't get that doing sustainable practices is the right thing, it's good business practices for the long run, chances are that such a company is not going to exist. And when you know, regulators tighten the screws, as you would have seen maybe in China over the recent years, they are, of course, the first companies to, uh, to disappear. Just talking about how we can expect the regulators to, to uh, underpin in this. Uh, we have, of course, also been in close contact with the, with the Chinese regulators who are the industry associations. And, and we've seen a very large uh, interest in also spreading the principles that, that TFS is having. And, and that's why I think one of the things we're also very proud of is that, that we have now uh, the first Chinese member as part of our uh, TFS, which is also a, a completely new uh, way that it's not us auditing Chinese and Indian uh, suppliers. You know, they are becoming part of the uh, whole assessment as well. So that's the evolution that we've seen in the, the last couple of years. Okay, uh, the questions are flowing thick and fast, but unfortunately, uh, we are running out of time. Perhaps we can take one more question. Thomas Bertrand, are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So here's a question from Keith. He's the Chief Procurement Officer of GoDaddy. So here's the question. There is a generalization that sustainability is centric to manufacturing industries. How has this initiative been extended to the high-tech industry and of the participants in the initiative? Uh, basically, he's asking, are there high-tech companies involved and actively taking part in making decisions for sustainable sourcing? Uh, I mean, if you have any examples that you can share to keep uh, the CPO of GoDaddy, it'll be great. Yeah, I think what, what we see in terms of uh, SPP is that there are very broad representation from many, many companies, uh, including the, uh, the high tech. Uh, so, I mean, the most recent uh, was also on, on LinkedIn. So, the head of uh, sustainable procurement in Amazon has joined us, for example. And we have it in many other uh, organizations as well. And I think that also shows that it's not a manufacturing only topic that we are we are looking at. Once you get into scope three, it's pretty much everything. It's your energy, it's your consultants, it's, it's all the spend, how you operate, which needs to be looked upon. So, so I think it's true. It, it was more linked with direct materials and, and it was easier maybe to calculate life cycle analysis around that. But it, it's really a, a moving into areas and particularly when it comes to a worker you know um, human rights uh, worker access ethics are just as relevant in in service industries as they are in, in more manufacturing based this is very much related to um, what we have learned through the TFS initiative together was we are very grateful to all our team members who have already carrying the processes into the countries everywhere and engaging with suppliers and together of building the future and i think it was probably one of the origin of our inspiration for spp um, it, it's at the end of the day um, a personal decision a responsibility and a, and a leadership um, that individuals want to carry and to carry together and this is going through and this is why why we came with that idea that it should be cross industries cross regions cross nationalities um, it's 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 around the globe and it is in our hands um, and it is really in our hands as individuals and as members of different organizations, big, small, middle-sized companies, wherever we are, but also academias. Academias are there also to create that mindset and to engage the mindset and to associate leadership and sustainability, creating the future. So um, thank you very much for your question because it is going very much beyond across industries and I think this is a CEO agenda, and this is why uh, we strongly believe into that journey of sustainability. 
Thank you all for listening to us and joining. We welcome you as ambassadors if you wish, if it's the right thing for you. And uh, hope to see you again one day soon. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you, Sakti, for organizing it. Thank you very much to Beryl. Thank yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas and Bertrand, for taking time out uh, uh, for this session. Uh, that was a very insightful discussion uh, on how best to incorporate sustainability initiatives in our work life. Uh, we have received uh, several more interesting questions, but like I said, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, we will try and uh, uh, reply by email to all the questions uh, that were not answered uh, in today's sessions. Uh, I will compile them all and I will email it to both of you. Uh, so, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This marks the end of our session. A big thank you to all the participants for logging in today uh, amidst all your busy schedules. Uh, we will be sharing the webinar recording link uh, with all of you soon. Please do reach out to me uh, on the email address uh, that's uh, given on the screen uh, if you have any additional questions or if you would, if you would like to uh, discuss uh, any other uh, procurement related topic, feel free to drop me a line. Uh, I'm more than happy to talk to you and carry carry out the articles on Procurement Espresso. Uh, this marks the end of our session. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Sakshi. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.